Our lesson today will be from Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. It's always our effort in the churches of Christ. It's our effort to go back to the Bible and see what the Bible church was like. And then we want to restore that same form of Christianity. We want to be the same church as Jesus created, the one that's in the Bible. And the book of Acts gives us an opportunity to look into the very beginning of the church, its infancy, what it was like then, to see the principles by which they were following the things that God had given them and the inspiration of the presence of the apostles and the teachings that they brought to the page. And there's just nowhere else to go to find it like that and, and to find it in its purity. And so that's what we're doing. And we found that the church began in Acts chapter two. It was first set up by the giving of the Holy Spirit early in that chapter and the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when people first obeyed the gospel, the Bible says that the Lord added to the church daily in chapter two and verse 47, those who are being saved. That's how it all began. And then of course, there's a business in chapter three of the apostles going up to the temple for the hour of prayer, they did the first miracle after the, the healing of that individuals and clamor began and some people were impressed. And finally, where we reached last Sunday, we found that there were some 5,000 men alone besides women and children. What an exciting time in the life of the church there. But I see in this passage we have today, there is a continuing principle that starts to be evident and, and easily focused upon. That is that this was a praying church. The New Testament church was a praying church. We're restoring New Testament Christianity. Let's make sure that we're not just involved in restoring the plan of salvation and the order of worship or anything like that, but we get the spirit that's involved in it. And this was a church that prayed. That's not a surprise, actually. When you look back at the life of Jesus and his ministry with the apostles, the scripture is clear that this is what he was teaching them. In fact, they sensed the need for it enough that they asked for it. When you look at Luke chapter 11, the scriptures say that as Jesus was praying in a certain place, the apostles came to him and they asked him, teach us to pray like John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. And then he gave them a lesson. In Matthew, as Matthew records the Sermon on the Mount in chapter six, one of the things that Jesus talked about was prayer. He said, when you pray, pray like this. And there's what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer that we'll study under some other umbrella sometime. But he was teaching them to pray. Luke chapter 18 begins with the fact that Jesus taught his disciples they ought always to pray and not to faint or to faint not. That is, don't ever give up, don't ever cease. That's continued the teaching of the Apostle Paul in chapter five of the book of Thessalonians, whenever he said, pray without ceasings in all things, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, so it's no surprise that they would pray. When you look at that first chapter of Acts, when they were about the business of re replacing as an apostle, Judas, who'd betrayed the Lord, they went to God in prayer and asked him to lead them in choosing the right person. And then the lot fell on Matthias and they could know this is God's choice because we asked him to lead us. If you go to chapter two and you find just as the church first came, when Peter had said to the people who cried out and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? He told them that they believed, who were believers, needed to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And he promised, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He went on to testify and preach to them many other things and signs and wonders. And then the scripture says in verse 41, they that gladly received the word were baptized and were and added to them that day about 3,000 souls. Verse 42 says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread. And here it is, and in prayer, they prayed a great deal. There's significance, I think, in the fact that the apostles went up to 
the temple at the hour of prayer. They were still engaged in prayer services with people, even though the church had begun. Here were people in the temple who already were believers in God. What a logical place to go and find a venue where there'd be listeners as they talked about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the authenticity of him as the prophesied savior of the world that God had promised for so long and they were supposed to be looking for. So they were looking for praying people and they themselves were continuing to pray. But of course, the business of the miracle, the healing of the man who'd been lame ever since his birth, he was 40 years old, caused the leaders to begin to say, you know, this, this movement, and that's how they would have seen it, this new thing, this, this business of people who are following Jesus may in fact get out of hand. They may violate the traditions that he did, and, and we not, may not be able to control this thing. We don't know where it leads. And so they're thinking, we better get a damper on it now while we can. We better bring this under control. Let's stop this preaching and teaching in the streets and in the temple and wherever they have an opportunity. And they called in the apostles and they said, don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. Now they first asked, by what authority are you doing this? And Peter was the one who said, we're doing this through Jesus. If you're talking about how this man happened to be healed, it's by the power of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you have already killed. That's how it came about. That's who it is. And further, he said, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the only answer. Well, they didn't like that at all, but they said, we can't deny, here's the man standing with them who is healed. And a lot of people believe it, so what do we do now? They kept him in prison overnight in jail. Then they called out and said, here's the ruling. Just don't say this anymore. We're going to let you off. We're going to give you a way out. Just hush. Don't let this happen anymore. Then the apostles who were fishermen and things like that, hadn't been trained, didn't have political experience or anything, just boldly said to the Sanhedrin court, you decide for yourselves what you must do, but we cannot but tell the things that we have seen and heard. And they still had to let them go. Now let's start reading when we get to verse 23 and see what happened after that. When they had released them, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against the anointed. They start to pray, folks. The key here, the church was a praying church. Whenever the report came, they've told us that we ought not to anymore preach in the name of Jesus. They went to God about it. They acknowledged God as sovereign they acknowledged him as the creator, as the only God and father, as the only one to whom they could turn. And as they did, they lifted him up and they lifted up Jesus and they quoted scripture to verify that these were the things that could have been anticipated that ought to be expected and they bring in that. I think sometimes that when we're examining prayers, we say, well, a person ought not to quote scripture in prayer and it seems sometimes that it might not fit all together but here's one of the first prayers that we know anything about and i think it's the first one that's directly quoted in the early church they do go back and prophesy or speak of prophecy in the old testament citing it and so if someone cites a little bit of scripture in prayer it's biblically based now there are those who sometimes think that, that that's done for show and they would criticize for that reason. Brother John Bannister is one of the greatest 
pulpit preachers I ever knew. He preached for the Skillman Avenue Church in Dallas, Texas for some 40 years or more. John Bannister had one of those preacher voices. He, he had it whether he was in the pulpit or not. And it almost seemed that he spoke in the King James because he was so clear in all that he said. And you could hear him so well with or without a PA system. We had the preacher's luncheon back then down at the downtown YMCA in Dallas. And I remember that one Friday John was there and they were doing the news and kind of show and tell among the preachers after the luncheon. And John said, brethren, I've had an experience in my most recent meeting that I never had before. They said, what was it? He said, I heard a man quoting scripture in his prayer. And he said, that's not so unusual. But this one told God where to find it. I'd never heard that before, he said. <laughs> it's one thing to, to cite scripture, it's another to tell God where it's found. You could almost think that, that God was saying, I wonder where I put that. But he knew. When we pray, we pray from the heart. We pray from the center of our soul. And the things that are on our heart are the things that we say to God. After we have acknowledged him as the Lord God Almighty, and as long as we give him credit and glory in that all, and it's pouring forth from our hearts, then that's as it ought to be. These people were doing that. There was a time in the church whenever we would have sometimes all night prayer meetings. Sometimes long ago, we would refer to Wednesday night assemblies as prayer meetings. And as I understand it, there used to be a whole lot more prayer that went on in the church that we may typically have today. If we're trying to restore New Testament Christianity, I call for us to think again about the issue of shortening and lessening the amount of prayer that we do individually or we do as a body. Note the point that's made here as this is introduced, that they all lifted up their voices together. The whole church that was assembled at least at that point in time, their friends all were engaged in the business of praying to God and they had some specific things for which they wished to ask God. Notice, for truly, he, he, they, we're picking up at 27 after the quotation, for truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. And while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your body, of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, notice that I'm going to break off in the middle of the sentence. Whenever they prayed, they asked for two things in particular. They said, Lord, give us the boldness, give us the strength, give us the ability to continue in spite of the threats, in spite of the limitations they're trying to put upon us, keep us bold enough to preach the gospel no matter who says not to, no matter where they say we can't go, we're supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Give us the courage, give us the boldness to do it. And you stay with us and you show us by the signs and wonders in your presence. You show us that you're with us. And then that's, that's what we need. We need boldness and we need to know you're with us. And so look what happened. The consequence of that prayer and the results of it, while you stretch out your, your hand to heal and the signs and wonders are performed through the name of the your holy servant, Jesus Christ. And when they had prayed, the place 
in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. God acted. They said, we want you to show us that you're with us. And God shook the building where they were. <laughs> I guess so they knew he was there. They knew he's answering us. And so they went out and with the boldness they asked for, they're able to continue to preach and to teach just like they'd been doing and perhaps even with greater boldness as the scriptures later speak of the Apostle Paul is preaching with greater boldness than what he'd had before, even after his conversion. You see, God can make things happen. Over in Acts 16, whenever Paul and Silas are in jail at midnight and they are praying and they are singing, God shook another building. He shook that one all to pieces and set them free. Whenever we pray to God in faith for his power, to let us be bold and his power to show that he is with us. Things happen. I fully believe things still happen. I'm not talking about an earthquake and that sort of thing, but God intervenes to bring out his eternal purpose like they prayed. We, want, we know that these things are happening and they persecuted Jesus so that the things that you always prophesied would occur, did occur. We understand that, but now it's up to us and we need you to help us, help us be bold. Show us you're with us. And we fast forward 2,000 years approximately. And now it's up to us. And we need boldness. We live in an age and generation. Whenever people are making light of the gospel, they're making light of Jesus and God. They're treating it with disdain. And it's difficult for us not to be intimidated, and we need to ask God, give us the boldness. And Lord, give us success. Show us, show us that we are doing right by the fruit that we have, by the souls that we can save, by the power that we can have, the courage that we have. God be with us to do great things because folks in our age, just like in the first generation of the church, Bold, brave, courageous things need to be done. And prayer, I believe, will help us to accomplish that as it did in the New Testament church. They ask and God did. They ask and God performed. And the church continued to be a praying congregation. They even went beyond praying. They also were a generous kind of people too. Look at 32 and following the scripture says, and now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one, no one said that anything of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. People were not selfish. They shared what they had. These are people who had come from, in some cases, other countries who were in need. They'd stayed over and the church had started and they hadn't had provision to stay that long. They're still here. But the people who had something shared with them. And fellowship, that is the word fellowship comes from the same word as communion to suggest the idea of a commonness and they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and great grace was upon them all. And there was not a needy person among them for as many as were owners of land and houses sold them and they brought the proceeds of what was sold and they laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed so that as any had need, and they, and this, thus Joseph, here's an introduction of an individual you hear a lot about in the book of Acts. A special donor, a special giver is now singled out. They explain that Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him, and he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. 
When people love the Lord, they want to share with him and with his cause. These praying people became giving people. They were sacrificial for the sake of the unity of the body and the fulfillment of all things. And consequently, the supply of what was needed was there. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 deal with the business of sharing and basically says if you give willingly, if you give generously and willingly into the, the cause of Jesus Christ, God will make sure you have what you need, but other people can have what they need as well. And the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace continues because we love each other, we help each other, we pray for each other, we give to each other, we encourage each other, we support each other because we're family in the kingdom of God. That's the way our model church was. And if we restore New Testament Christianity, may God help us that we restore those elements appropriately as we restore doctrine. If you're part of the kingdom today, I hope you're living faithfully to the Lord and that you have boldness and courage. I hope that you are praying regularly and continually. I pray that you are using the power of prayer in your own life. You're praying for the church and for the souls that we contact, for the prospects that we have, that they'll become obedient to the Lord. But if you've lost your courage, you need it back. You know, Alex is going to be the timid lion soon, aren't you? He needed courage, and Alex is going to find it. But we need courage too. We need to be bold. We need to get our feet under us and stand up to whatever criticism, whatever discouragement Satan and the world may have to give us. We need that kind of courage. We need that kind of faithfulness. We need people who are not just coming to church on Sunday morning and maybe even missing some of those. We don't need people who are just filling the pews, but we need people filling the pews who love the Lord, who understand the power that we have when God is on our side, and they want some of that. You lost that. Let us pray with you about it because you need it. If you're a part of the kingdom, don't consider, well, that's a free pass because faithfulness is required. If you're part of those who are near the kingdom, maybe you know what you ought to do. I understand, you may say. I do believe, and I see the need for repentance. I know the Bible teaches that. I've got to change, and I need to confess my Lord and be baptized in his name for the remission of sins. I just haven't done it. I haven't had the courage yet. Well, may you have the courage, and if you have it this morning, any of you who need to come for any reason, be bold. Come forward while we together stand and sing.